2006, we have um, been getting 300 billion tweets. And um, recently, I, I think earlier this year, we had a new um, record in terms of how many tweets were sent per second, and it was a astonishing like 140,000. I think it was some, I didn't follow it too closely, but some TV show in Japan, I think, caused this. Uh, and um, specific to search, we have two billion, more than two billion search queries per day. That combines um, our apps, our website, and also uh, widgets that are uh, embedded on third-party websites. So it's a pretty massive scale because um, Twitter is all about real time, so we have to be able to index, as I said, half a billion tweets every day, but also make them searchable to two billion queries every day. And the latency between indexing them and search uh, or tweeting and when they are supposed to be searchable, those tweets, is supposed to be like less than 10 seconds or less than five seconds. So it's, it's not an easy problem. So I just give a very high level overview of the architecture. Um, because we only have 30 minutes today, I want to really dive into some of the Lucene modifications. So basically, this slide is about tweet search. We also have um, user search at Twitter, but I'm focusing right now on tweet search. We have two different pipelines. One is for the real-time stream of tweets. So we get the real-time uh, um, stream of tweets from the API. They are just raw text. Um, and then we have a Lucene-based analyzer that is called Penguin, actually. It's also open source. Um, it's an analyzer based on you know, some work we did in-house, but also some of the open source uh, Lucene analyzers that are out there, and a the partitioner. Um, the analyzed tweets then get sent to our real-time index, and the code name is Early Bird. Everything kind of on Twitter has a bird as a code name, so our uh, real-time index is called Early Bird. And um, that indexes tweets in real-time in memory and makes them searchable. We have also a offline portion on the lower part of the slide here uh, for our tweet archive, which contains the tweets of uh, all tweets of the history of Twitter, or I should say the best tweets throughout the history of Twitter um, since 2006. It's much, much bigger, and it's stored on SSDs. The, the real-time part has about like you know, a few days to a few weeks of tweets in memory. All the rest is uh, stored on SSD. So the pipeline for the archive looks very similar. We have the tweets. You know, we, we, we store them in HDFS. And then we use the MapReduce analyzer to uh, kind of call the same you know, analy analyzation code as in the real-time pipeline, produce tweets, and then we actually have index builders running on Mesos, if you are familiar with that. That's a, a cloud computing uh, engine. And um, so we build um, index segments on Mesos and then copy them to the serving machines, the early bird serving machines, to serve um, traffic. Another component we have is uh, blue box here, or which we call our blender. The blender is the component that receives search requests from the API or from our apps um, via Thrift. Thrift is also an Apache project. Uh, it's a serialization format. And it fans out these requests to different to, to the different search indexes. I have another slide about that. Um, one additional thing I want to mention, we also have a stream of updates. So for example, if you know, your favorite or retweet a tweet or you delete a tweet, those are, those are updates uh, that we get through a different pipeline and we apply them um, mostly in place in both clusters, no matter if it's um, in the archive or in, the in memory index. We can apply these signals um, in place in memory. That's a little different to, uh, to vanilla Lucene. So as I said, our, our Blender is our Thrift service aggregator. So it, it, it fans out the request, the API request to different services. So for example, the um, you know, real-time tweet index, archive tweet index, user search index, which is also Lucene-based, um, to social graphs that you can you know, do custom personalization of search results. Then it receives all the responses, merges them together, and sends them back as a response so that the clients can render the, the results page. So now if you look at the components here that are based on Lucene, that are search indexes, those are the archive index, the real-time index, and the user search index. So his, for historic reasons, different teams kind of started working on these, and we did, you know, in 2009, we did an acquisition of a different company that brought in some technology. So for, for different reasons, these code bases were separate. Um, so over the, year, uh, over the years, we you know, wanted to share features across these different Lucene-based technologies, 
especially the real timeness that we developed for tweet search, also for user search. So um, some ugly cross dependencies were introduced to share code. So um, it's, you can see that the user search depends here on tweet search, which is not ideal because I, they are kind of different products and different data models. So we wanted to kind of improve this. So what we did um, more recently was we actually um, introduced kind of an, an, a layer, a library, which is our Lucene extension library, the light blue box here. So now the dependencies are much cleaner. Um, the Lucene extensions library does not depend on any product like, or any data, a specific document type like tweets or users. It's a pure extension on top of Lucene that doesn't have a dependency up here and um, has additional features like real-time search and a few other things that I will talk about in a second. And also the different products here like you know, tweet search and user search don't have a cross dependency anymore, so that's much nicer. Um, and this, I, I want to really mention this here because this gets us also a lot closer to actually open sourcing the work we did around Lucene and the extensions because before, where it was tied to my, very much to, um, to our data models, it, it was a little bit harder to open source this. Okay. So, a few things I want to focus on today are um, about this library. We have an abstraction layer for Lucene index segments. We have a real-time index writer for real-time search, building real-time indexes. Um, we introduced a schema similar to Elasticsearch and Solar, and uh, we can also do real-time faceting. I probably don't have enough time to talk about the faceting today, but um, if you download the slides, I have them attached to the end. So the API layer for Lucene segments is helpful because it helps us to abstract away from the fact that and a Lucene segment is built in memory for real-time search versus one that's stored on disk. So we introduced kind of a higher level writer and reader API that um, deals only with segments. A segment in Lucene, if you're familiar, basically one segment is um, an index that has you know, one file for posting this, it has one dictionary, and you don't have to um, you know, do multiple term lookups, for example, so it's, it's, it's one inverted index. So for each of these like write and reader interfaces, we have um, two implementations, one for in memory, that's our early bird um, real-time index, and for on disk, that's basically vanilla Lucene based. Currently we are using for the archive Lucene 4.4, uh, but we are in the process of upgrading to um, the latest 4.10.2. So these index segments can be built in different ways. So as I said, they can build, be built in real time uh, in memory, we can build them on Mesos or MapReduce, or even locally on the serving machines itself, um, which we are still doing in a few cases, but we are kind of moving away from that for you know, simplicity reasons. Um, and then we have cluster management code that, has, that can deal with index segments and doesn't have, to be, doesn't have to know how they were produced. So it can just, uh, it, does, it only knows about the segments and can like, move them around and assign them to serving machines. This cluster management code can also rebuild the segments for example, what I just said, when we upgrade to a new Lucene version, or when we want to change the, the schema of our data, uh, or index additional like fields that we introduce on tweets and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of like just a picture how this looks like what I described. Um, we use HDFS to share these segments. We have these different ways of, um, of building them, and early bird, our index serving machines, can grab them from HDFS and serve them. Okay, so now I want to um, dive more into the real timeness because that's probably the biggest um, change or addition that we made to Lucene. I've talked about some of this stuff um, two years ago, I think, at the conference. Um, a lot of these underlying data structures have changed, um, but some parts that haven't changed are our concurrency model, and I, wa I want to like talk a few minutes about that because I think it's very interesting, and I think there's a lot of information you can take home to your own project about concurrency, so I want to focus on that a little bit. Um, but um, one thing I want to mention about first about our way of doing real-time searches, we, we're not using Lucene's near real-time feature because that feature, um, you, you kind of index documents in memory, but before you can actually search them, you have to open a pretty expensive reader which causes these in-memory data structures to get flushed to Lucene directory. Um, and that's 
a pretty expensive operation, especially if you do it very often, because you end up with a lot of segments in memory or on disk, and you need to keep merging them. So since we need our, since we have so many tweets per second, and we need our data to be always fresh, that's, that wasn't an option for us. So what we developed was a system where you can actually search that buffer in memory while you're appending to it in a log-free way. Um, and I want to describe how this, how it works that we can append to data structure while we are, while we are re accessing it um, without logs. So uh, for, for that, I want to introduce a few definitions about concurrency. First, pessimistic locking is, I think, what people are most familiar with. It's in Java, for example, if you use a synchronized keyword, you enter synchronized block and the thread that does it has an exclusive access to that resource until it exits the synchronized block. I think everybody knows that. Um, usually that, that concurrency pattern is used if conflicts are expected to be likely. Optimistic locking, on the other hand, um, tries to perform an atomic opti uh, operation optimistically, so it just tries out if it works, and then there's mechanisms to detect if something went wrong, and then you have a retry logic. So you should only use this, t this technique um, if, you know, conflicts are expected to be the exception, because otherwise you will spend a lot of time for your retry logic, and then it doesn't really help you. But in our case, actually, conflicts are not very likely to happen, um, if you think about where we could get conflicts, we are writing a lot of terms, a lot of posting lists, and it's pretty unlikely that at the same time while we are writing one specific term, a reader would also access that, that same term. And um, therefore, we have a lot of data, but it's not that likely that exactly the same data will be accessed by multiple threads at the same time. Okay. Then about blocking and, and log-free algorithms. So non-blocking algorithms are algorithms that basically don't produce a deadlock where the whole system always makes progress. A log-free algorithm is an uh, algorithm where there's guaranteed system-wide progress and a wait-free algorithm means that every thread at any time can make progress. So in our system, we always for a segment have a single writer thread which makes our lives a little easier because then we don't have to worry about two writer threads corrupting the same data structure, but we have many reader threads serving queries. So we now only have to worry about that the reader threads always see a consistent snapshot of what the writer produced. And um, that sounds kind of easy, but it's not very easy because you have to really take care of the data. You know, the writer writes data maybe into its local, you know, L1 CPU cache, but then readers run maybe on a different CPU and you know, they need to access through shared memory the data, so you, know, you have to make sure that data gets published through shared memory in a consistent way. In Java, it's, kind of, it's called safe publication. There's a really good book about it, Java Concurrency in, Pre in Practice, which I always recommend at this point. And it's a really, really good book. And in this book, um, it also describes the Java memory model. And um, it would take too long now to describe the whole model, but I want to pick three rules that are enough to describe what we are doing here. The first one is a program order rule, which means basically that a program in Java is executed in the way you write it. So, you know, line one in your program gets executed before line two, before line three. Everybody kind of knows this rule implicitly. Um, we have the volatile variable rule. That means if we are writing to volatile, in Java volatile field, every subsequent read of uh, this field from a different thread um, will see the update, right? So the write will happen before the read. And we have transitivity. So if A happens before B and B happens before C, then uh, A happens before C. Okay, so let's, let's look at an example here. And I have a disclaimer. What's really happening in the JVM um, might be exactly what I have on the slide, but it may also not exactly. The, the, the observed effect is the same, but there are diff a lot of different things going on in the JVM. So if if always the cache and the RAM state are exactly on my slides, it's not, it kind of depends on the underlying platform and the JVM you're using. I had a PhD point that out to me when I gave this talk, so I wanted to mention that now. So let's say we have two threads. One is assigning the value five to variable X. X is not volatile. So X, just updates that value, uh, sorry, thread one updates X only in its local cache. Nothing forces it to 
commit that to shared memory to RAM. So now thread two has a while loop, it waits for X to become five. Since not, nothing is forcing the five to be written to shared memory, and since you know, thread two cannot access the local cache of thread one, this, this condition may never become true. Very likely it will never become true. So let's change this example a little bit. Let's take two variables. Now we introduce also a volatile field B. So now what thread one does is first it, it assigns in a non-volatile write the value five to X, and it, in a volatile write it, it assigns the value one to B. What thread two does, it, it reads B, it's a volatile read, uh, uh, read and then it um, performs the say, same while loop that we have seen before. So now, now let's analyze this program. So we take our program order rule. That means x equals five happens before b equals one, and in thread two, the dummy read happens before the while loop. We take the volatile rule, which means the assignment of b equals one happens before um, the read of b in the other thread. And now we take transitivity. That means then now x equals five happens before the while loop checks that condition and therefore it will see the update. And what's really cool about this actually is that um, the really cool thing about this is we didn't turn x, which is our data, we didn't turn that into a volatile field. The only thing we introduced was one volatile variable and the side effect of this assignment of, of b causes x to get flushed into shared memory too. So I have a short demo about this because it, otherwise it may be hard to believe. So I have a small program here in Eclipse. And as you can see, um, what it does is it has a writer thread and a few reader threads. Here in the main loop, it uh, you know, starts the different readers, prints out there, started, then it starts a writer and waits for the writer to um, finish its job. What the writer does is just it increments a counter until the counter reach max, max is a thousand. So it should get there pretty quickly. Um, after that's done, it sets our memory barrier field to one. Memory barrier is a volatile field here. You can see here it's volatile. You can also see that the counter, which is you know, on our previous slide, X, is not volatile, right? The reader basically just has a while loop. It wi waits you know, for the counter to reach max. It's kind of the same while loop we had on the slide before. Um, right now, I'm not doing the dummy read. I'm, I commented that out. So let's see what happens if I start this program. So you see down here, it prints out our reader thread started, but um, none of them printed out that they were finished, right? Okay, so by now it should probably have counted to a thousand, so I, I stop the program, I uncomment this line here. And you can see that actually Eclipse gives you a warning that this dummy field is not used. So Eclipse actually says I could remove the statement you know, it wouldn't change my program, and that's actually wrong. Uh, Eclipse is wrong here. So if I, if I run the program now, you can see that the real threads are done immediately. And again, I didn't actually change, you know, the counter to be volatile, for example. I didn't change anything. The only thing I did was I now, I'm now doing one volatile read in the real thread, which causes it to flush the counter value into shared memory. So that's kind of cool. So how we are using how are we using this in search? Um, now, if you look at Lucene's index writer reader model, um, what we can do now is we can, for example, write a hundred documents, and all of, writing these documents, we during writing these, we only do non-volatile, you know, very fast writes. We didn't make we we, we don't have to make any of the underlying data structures volatile. Um, the only thing we need to do is, at some point we do, we need to do one volatile write. So let's say after 100 documents, we, um, we assign to a variable called, called max doc, the value, you know, 100, because we have written 100 docs, and max doc is volatile. So that actually forces now all the data structures we have previously written to, to be flushed into shared memory. Because of what happens before roots now, um, uh, the index reader will first, before it serves the query, it will actually read max doc, so it does a volatile read, read and therefore it will be able to see all the changes we made to, um, to the data structures. That's really cool because now what we do at Twitter, two billion times per day, we actually open a new index reader. Every search gets its own fresh index reader with its own fresh 
max dot, so it always sees the latest snapshot of the index. So the index itself has actually a sub-second latency in terms of, um, you know, when we index a document to when it's searchable. If you did that with a scene, every time you open an index reader, it would actually cause a flush, as I mentioned earlier, produce a new segment, uh, a new segment, and at some point you would probably get trouble in, uh, you know, keeping up with merging these. Okay, as a summary for, for the concurrency model, we don't have a single exclusive lock here. The writer can always make progress. One thing I didn't mention is we, in one place, we have an optimistic retry logic. However, for this uh, logic, there's only two potential cases. So, you know, if, you know, case one doesn't succeed, case two will. So it's, um, it can never get into, into a state where it has to retry forever. Um, therefore, this is a wait-free system. Okay. A uh, few more words about our real-time index. Um, it's highly optimized for GC, so we barely have objects. We store all our data in blocked arrays, native arrays. In uh, V1, which we deprecated like maybe a little more than a year ago, um, we optimized our posting list highly for tweets. Tweets can only have 140 characters, so we optimized our data structures that they can only hold 255 positions. Um, we introduced yeah, in 2013, we introduced a new version of posting this encoding. Uh, same concurren concurrency model that I just described, but different um, memory model. And um, now it can encode the full 32-bit positions like Lucene, so we can index any type of documents. And uh, we actually even added out-of-order posting list support. Uh, very basic. Um, we are working on making that more generic. But um, yeah, that too. And yeah, um, a little while ago I sent this tweet and I thought it was kind of cool that when we actually removed V1, um, I calculated a little bit that it actually served like one trillion queries over its lifetime in just three years, or a little over three years. And the other cool thing about V2 is actually while it has the, all these new features, it's, there's no performance degradation at all and it doesn't need more memory. It's kind of cool. So a very new thing that I hadn't ta have never talked about well, is that uh, is our real-time term dictionary, the change we made to that one. It used to be a basically a log-free hash table where term lookups are uh, possible in all one, like in any hash table. Um, however, it never maintained an ordering on the terms. So Lucene features like range queries or fuzzy queries weren't possible um, because you need to sort a term dictionary for that. However, it's, it's kind of hard to maintain a sort of term dictionary in a log-free environment because you, you, know, you have to insert a term somewhere in the middle and maybe you have to shift memory around and then the sole memory model gets very complicated if you want to keep it log-free, wait-free. Um, so we thought we would use, um, and this idea has been mentioned on the Lucene uh, mailing list before, but now we, saw, we thought we'd try it out. So we, we wanted to implement a probabilistic skip list that maintains the ordering. And a perfect skip list is not possible here, as I will um, show you in a second, because you always have to rebalance them if you insert something in the middle. But with a probabilistic skip list, that's a little different. So if you look at the perfect skip list, um, you have these you know, very um, recurring patterns of tower heights here. If you, um, if you want to insert a term somewhere in the middle, you have to reshuffle and rebalance these towers so that you, you end up still with a perfect skip list, right? So it's very hard to index something in the middle here. Um, and as I said, you would have to shift memory around. If for some term you already indexed, you know, the tower height changes, you need more memory for it. So you need to, like, you know, you, you can get into problems like fragmenta fragmentation and any, into any problems that, you know, mem, uh, mem allocation, uh, memory allocators get. So we use a probabilistic skip list. And here, it's kind of random how the pattern will look like. What you do is actually before you insert a term, before you even know at what position you, the term is supposed to get inserted in the skip list, you, you roll a dice. So randomly you decide the tower height. Um, and then you find the position for the new term and you insert it there. So that means you never have to rebalance tower heights of previously inserted terms. And uh, you can allocate memory for your new term once and you never will have to change it. So that's very nice with our memory model and with our um, concurrency model that I, that I described a minute ago. 
because now you only have to make sure, you know, after you allocated the memory and you've written your data to it, you have to make sure you do safe publication. We just can, can see a consistent snapshot, and then you can be sure that this data will not get touched anymore. The only thing then you have to do is you have to take care of updating, if you insert something in the middle, you have to take care of updating these, these pointers between towers, but that's, that's, um, you know, that's not that hard to do in a, in a log-free way. Okay. Um, last thing I want to mention about the Lucene um, extension library is our um, schema-based document factory. It's, it's, I think it's similar to Solar and Elasticsearch. You know how Lucene doesn't really have a schema. Every document can have different field settings, even with, for the field, same field name. Um, what we introduced was a schema based on thrift, so and a thrift document object, a struct. So the thrift document is very simple, um, you know, struct that has a list of fields, field names, and, and, and value pairs. And then we have a schema that and the, and the schema document factory. So the document factory receives both the schema and a thrift document. The schema only once per index, and of course, for every document you want to index, it gets one instance of a thrift document. And then it can do things like in, it can fill in default values, it can apply extended field settings, you know, and the right Lucene field settings. Um, we actually introduced a type system on top of Lucene doc values, so that's kind of cool uh, if you want to store relevance features like, you know, number of retweets, number of favorites. We pack them usually into smaller numbers, like eight, you know, eight-bit numbers, or we also store flags for documents. For example, if something is a, um, uh, is a retweet or not. So um, we do a lot of bit packing and for efficiency reasons. So this schema actually kind of provides a type system and makes it very easy to just introduce a new signal and store it in a document without having to like, you know, write ugly code that does bit shifting and stuff. Um, the schema also does validation if a document, you know, um, has the correct data and uh, the correct uh, settings. So that's kind of how it looks like. Um, I think not surprising, the thrift document uh, gets processed by the schema document factory. Each of our indexes, like user search, has a whole different schema, of course, as um, tweet search. And the schema document factory is, is the class in, the, you know, in this extension library, in this Lucene library. Um, again, it doesn't have to know anything about tweet search or about user search. All it needs to get is a schema. And then it can produce uh, appropriate Lucene documents And we have only two minutes left, so I don't think I have time to talk about the facets, and rather I would like to um, have a little bit of time for questions. I have one more slide, actually, just a little bit of an outlook. Um, what we want to do soon is add some of the remaining features that are missing in our real-time index, like you know, term statistics for ranking, um, like average field length, I think, stuff like that, term vector stored fields. We are not using that, but um, to make it really useful for everyone out there, um, we should add these. And support for parallel segments in our segment um, library so that it's easier to kind of rebuild segments partially without having to fully re index them. It's also a feature in, in Lucene that's not um, used that much yet, I think, out there. Okay. With that, um, we have uh, one or two minutes for questions. Do we have, I don't know if you have a microphone. Yeah. So will it be open source? Will it be open source? It's a question. Okay. Yes, but uh, I can't tell you when because I don't know. <laughs> but we are, um, we are making a lot of progress towards this point where it makes sense to open source it. Yeah. Especially the real time part. What's the advantage of having a schema-based doc document factory? Well, as I, um, it, for, for us, it's a little easier to detect errors, for example. Um, and it's also easier for internal consumers of our uh, Lucene, um, you know, library that they can just write like a schema and, and don't need to understand all the underlying details, how you have to configure 
all the Lucene settings for a field. They, for example, say, I want a numeric field that I can look up during search time for ranking reasons. So they configure it this way, and then we take care of, like, you know, using the schema, and we apply the right settings that it has to get into a numeric doc values field, and maybe, maybe it's updatable, so we do that, and we take care of proper caching and that kind of stuff. So it's basically ease of use, and also that we can detect errors more quickly. Okay, I think we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much.